during the discussion on uh, diffraction, uh, I had shown you that the phase differences essentially remain entirely constant with time and when they are so, it is said to be a coherent system. Then only a, whenever there is only a coherent system, you get a regular diffraction pattern that is fringes of bright side and left bright and dark bright and dark uh, fringes. So, the spacing of the those brands um, depends on the distance between the slits. So, the we can uh, use this uh, equation n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta or d sin theta and if two different wavelengths of red and blue are used. Now, uh, what I am saying is you use two different sources making them pass through the same hole um, pin hole the two colors will be separated on the screen. So, if suppose we use a white light then what happens we see a number of small rainbows on the screen out across the pin holes. So, by placing a moving slit across the screen any color or wavelength can be chosen that is the fundamental principle of how we choose a wavelength whenever we want to make an estimation using a spectroscopic technique. So, in spectroscopic technique we use lenses, we use mirrors and then we use diffraction systems and that, um, then subsequently we can also use prisms and other things, but diffraction is a system which we are discussing right now because it is the in thing now that is the fashion. Prisms are also in use, but whenever we want to use a diffraction system all I have to do is make a pinhole, make the radiation pass through and collect the ra radiation across the pinhole on the on a screen or something like that. And then if I choose my slit uh, make my slit move from one end to the other end then I get different wavelengths. So, by placing a moving slit across the screen any color or wavelength can be selected. This principle is used in gratings. We will study more about gratings and their uses in spectroscopy later. Later means within a few minutes probably. So, next thing I want to discuss is about the prisms. So, what are we looking at? We are looking at prisms as dispersing devices. Now, in prisms uh, the we all know the rainbow colors and uh, in our high school studies we have st uh, we have uh, seen that even water small simple water droplets coming falling from the sky can act as prisms which as dispersing agents for the sunshine which passes through them giving you rainbow colors right. So, a prism disperses the incident radiation that is the job of prism. So, uh, I have shown you a picture of the prism here uh, it is a uh, 3 D prism basically. So, it has got four sides one one on the I am one uh, what we are seeing here and one on the other side one on this side one on the back side. So, such prisms you would have seen uh, in number of places including uh, art objects and uh, several other things and basically this prism is made of quartz or a glass. Okay. So, a prism the job of the prism is to pick up the radiation falling on it and disperse the components. So, uh, depending on the refractive index the and its variation with, with its wavelength we get the scale that suppose the wavelength is uniform ok dispersion is uniform then the scale also be will also be uniform. So, what I have to do is I just have to provide a slit in which the slit can be moved arithmetically that is one step at a time. So, if it is anomalous 
then the scale will not be uniform. At that point, we need different uh, uh, mechanisms to go from one wavelength to the uh, another wavelength. So, a prism basically its use is to disperse the radiation electromagnetic radiation and what are they ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation. So, the um, suppose you want to use uh, prisms uh, or gratings in x ray you will not be able to use it. It is only meant for ultraviolet visible and infrared radiation this point you should remember. So, the material of construction again depends upon the wavelength region which we want to separate. Suppose, it is ultraviolet I will need a different material such as quartz. If it is visible range I need glass. So, of course, quartz also will work for glass and for infrared radiation etcetera we need different kinds of materials such as sodium chloride and uh, other salts uh, made into some sort of a conical prism sh prismatic shape. Okay. So, the material of construction again depends upon the wavelength region. Here I have shown you uh, that the white light is falling on this phase of the prism and then it uh, undergoes refraction at different places uh, depending upon the length the separation will be better if the prism is big the separation will be better if the prism is small they would be bunched together somewhere around this thing. Now, I so like this in this region they are all bunched together here as the distance between the two sides increases opposite sides increases the wavelengths will be separated in a much better fashion. So, if you take white light we end up with red orange yellow I think most of you are aware of the job of prism. Now, I can have different kinds of prisms one is like this where the apex angle is 60 degrees another one is I take the same thing and cut into exactly half something like this take one portion okay, either left side portion or right side portion and I mirror this this phase then what happens the incoming radiation will come like this go like this come back and get reflected on the mirrored surface here goes back and then comes out of the same direction here it is it is coming out and moving into the opposite direction. Okay. So, there are two types of prisms one which can have 60 degree apex angle and uh, that is this angle is 60 degrees this angle is also 60 this is also 60, but if I cut it here the angle would be 90 and this will be 45 and 45 degree angle. So, the 60 degree prism uh, can be constructed by fusing together 230 degree prisms. So, this is called as cornu type which one is cornu the right side is cornu and this left side is litro sorry the it is the other way around it is uh, fused one is called as cornu type that is this one fused uh, two uh, half prisms fused together is uh, gives you a 60 degree apex, apex angle and this is cornu type and if you take a single one mirrored on one side then it is litro type. So, in cornu mounting the rate dispersed radiation is collected across the prism and in litro mounting the dispersion is collected uh, on the same side. Here the refraction takes place twice if you look carefully it go reaches here goes there and comes back that means the total distance travelled by the light beam is both in is in both cases is same 
except that in uh, litro mounting the space occupied by the prism is much less. That means, if I use a litro mounting prism, I can reduce the I can reduce the size of the spectrograph or spectrometer. So, that is the advantage. So, the refraction takes place twice on the same side with less material coupled with saving of the space. That is the greatest advantage for litro mounting. Now, we will also look at monochromator slits. So, what is a monochromator slit? A monochromator slit is different from an ordinary slit in that the uh, slit the monochromator slit will separate wavelengths from each other, whereas an ordinary slit will only make the pick up a small portion of the light beam uh, light energy and uh, make it parallel and allow it to pass through a disperser. And this disperser is nothing but a prism either cornu or litro. Now, in this arrangement I have shown you here light source as a concave mirror okay. and uh, this side is mirrored that means, all the light is coming this side and because it is concave all the radiation are parallel in this case and I put a slit and in front of this slit I put my disperser that is the prism. So, uh, once the radiation comes out of the prism all the wavelengths are spread out uniformly and then longer wavelengths are at the top, shorter wavelengths are at the bottom. Now, this is the mechanical slit what we are talking about this is a monochromator slit now, because if I move the slit down here somewhere here I will be picking up a very short wavelength radiation and if I move it here higher wavelength another higher wavelength like that. I can choose any wavelength I want out of the dispersed radiation. Same thing is true with a concave mirror again here I can put a multi channel detector instead of moving the splay slit uh, taking one slit at a time I can make number of holes in a mechanical position fixed together which will allow me to pick up all the wave different wavelengths simultaneously. So, this is known as multi channel slit and the det I need a detector out across the multi channel so many detectors as many detectors as the wavelengths I want to work with. So, this is a typical arrangement in almost all spectrophotometers including atomic absorption. Okay. So, the slit in front of a monochromator slit in front of a monochromator plays a very important role in determining its performance characters performance characteristics as well as quality. So, usually two slits are employed one as the entrance slit which I had already shown you here in the previous figure. This one is the entrance slit this is exit slit. Okay. So, the entrance slit serves as the light source and another as the exit slit shows the image of the entrance slit that is formed essentially it is nothing but the image of the entrance slit. So, if the radiation source consists of a discrete wavelength by themselves a series of rectangular images appears on the exit side. The, this is what I have shown you here the uh, entrance slates it is all uh, parallel now. So, a rectangular slate is what I need on this side to pick up the different wavelengths. Okay. So, these appear as bright line corresponding to different wavelengths. So, movement of the monochromator setting in one direction or the other direction produces a continuous decrease or increase of the wavelength. That means, if I take a prism 
if I take a light source, put it in a concave the shell uh, with a mirror on the other side, take out the radiation and put a uh, prism uh, in cornu or litro type, put a screen across and then put the wavelengths uh, screen and then what I get is, if I move the slit slowly I get different wavelengths continuously or when the entrance slit image has moved a distance equal to its full width I get the different wavelengths. Okay. So, illumination of the exit slit with the desired wavelength is invariably associated with some unwanted radiation as shown here I want to show you in the next slide. Normally what happens is uh, look at this figure once again. Any rectangular slit here will also pick up some unwanted additional wavelengths nearby. You know you will never get a true monochromatic radiation. What is a monochromatic radiation? A monochromatic radiation is a wavelength of single uh, is a radiation of single wavelength and uh, unfortunately and practically it is not possible to pick up a single wavelength from a monochromatic uh, slit. So, there is always some wavelength associated with the wavelength what you want to choose, it is associated with some wavelengths of the lowers on the lower side as well as some wavelengths, some radiation having higher wavelength also. So, the combination of all the wavelengths put together is known as bandwidth. Okay. So, this bandwidth I am showing you here, I am, you can see this figure, I am assuming that this is the slit, okay, exit slit and then radiation is coming like this and this exit slit I have chosen fix the wavelength like this, this is what I want that is lambda 2. Okay, lambda 2 is here, but unfortunately it is also going to pick up some radiation of lambda 1 is associated with this, because where because of the distance uh, the wavelengths will conically separate. So, I have put the cone in the opposite direction here. So, if I am choosing this, I will also be choosing wavelengths from lambda 1 to lambda 2 also from lambda 2 to lambda 3 on the longer side. So, the actual wavelength wa radiant power uh, is the sum of all the radiant powers of each wavelength corresponding to this monochromator exit slit. Okay. So, I, as fine as the slit you make, you get a better and better wavelength range. You will never get a monochromatic light. So, you will get a mixture of wavelengths corresponding to some shorter wavelength plus longer wavelengths, but in the whole group maximum radiation will be the one what you choose from the scale what you wish for. Okay. So, the total radiation lambda 2 plus lambda 1 and lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is what is uh, what you are getting, but 50 percent of the intensity is uh, normally what we settle for and that is known as the Im imagine this is the cone and this represents 50 percent of the radiation actually it is does not look like, but I should have drawn it a little below and then it the line would have come here and that is known as effective bandwidth. So, whenever you want to buy a spectrophotometer or spectrometer, you should ask for what is the effective wavelength if or effective bandwidth. So, this is important. So, you should study the technical literature whenever you want to buy a, an atomic absorption spectrometer. Okay. So, now we move on to the 
detector part detectan detectors. So, now imagine that we have a spectrometer and I, I have the source, source is switched on you have put a slit collected another put a disperser collected another so fixed one more slit you have collected the radiation and this radiation is nothing but a number of photons emanating from the system corresponding to different wavelengths and these wavelengths we want to detect. Now, how do we detect? We make them fall on a detector generate the current. So, when a monochromatic light falls on a photo cathode, a cathode made of alkali metals. So, what happens? Electrons of various kinetic energies are released from the surface. You can imagine just like a wind carrying lot of particles coming and hitting your glass in a window at home and they make the pock marks right whenever the metal uh, so, uh, sand or some other particles come and hit your window it becomes fogged right. So, similarly if I make a an electrode and make the radiation fall on that they will um, fall on the alkali metals uh, electrodes and they make them fall on that it will release electrons. So, this electron being a negatively charged it will generate current and this current is measured. So, if the wavelength is very short the radiation is highly energetic. So, more current will be produced if the radiation is of longer wavelength they are less energetic less current will be produced. So, this is a way of detecting the wavelengths and then correlate the wavelength whatever we are connected to the intensity of the radiation. So, uh, what we are essentially doing is to increase to take advantage of the kinetic energy of the electrons emitted from the surface that fly once the electrons are released the they are attracted by the anode because electrons cannot exist uh, simply in space. So, if an alkali metal releases electrons they move into the space and reach towards a an electrode which is having positive charge that is known as anode. An electrode having a positive charge is known as anode. So, the electrons will be moving from the negative electrode to the positive electrode that is what we are showing here. So, they fly over to the anode and if you put both the electrodes in a photo tube as long as we apply a voltage between the anode and cathode is positive as long as it is positive a, a current I is produced in the circuit. So, when the voltage across the photo tube is adjusted such that anode is negative then what happens photo electro electrons are repelled and photo current decreases. So, it is essential that in a photo tube both anode and cathode should be there cathode anode should be maintained at a higher potential than the cathode then only the electrons will be attracted towards the higher energy anode. Okay. So, the principle is essentially same the photoelectric current is measured as a function of uh, the applied voltage we call it V 0 you can call it anything, but it is only a notation which I am using for my personal reasons because I am very familiar with V 0 at which the photoelectric current reaches 0 multiplied by the electronic charge that is 1.60 into 10 raise to minus 19 coulombs. So, the total uh, kinetic energy of the most electronic uh, most energetic electrons are measured in joules. So, when maximum kinetic energy for various coatings are plotted 
as a function of the radiation frequency you plot the energies of the radiation electrons. Then we get a straight line response with a typical slope that slope should be of Planck's constant that is 6 into 6.6254 into 10 raise to minus 34 joule second with the intercept w which is known as work function. This work function is a very special uh, uh, material property of the metals. Suppose I make an electrode of the alkali metals the work function is low that means electrons with minimum amount of energy can impinge on the electrode and release the electrons. So, the if it is metal like copper then they need higher energies to release the electrons from the metal. So, this work function is a very special property and the plots what you get of the energy energy plot can be described by this equation that is k e m is equal to h mu by minus w or e is equal to k e m plus w or that is should be equal to the difference between the energy of the radiation that is h c by lambda. So, the work function minus w is characteristic of the surface material which I already told you and that represents the minimum amount of energy of binding the electron. That means, if you want to release an electron from a metal coating what you should do is you should apply enough energy to exceed the work function that is w 0 then only the electrons will be released. Otherwise what happens? What happens to the energy that is supplied if it is less than work function? think about it, but I will have to give you the answer. The uh, answer is the electrons will vibrate, they will absorb the energy and just vibrate. Suppose, you are standing on a heated uh, uh, metal uh, plate, what happens? You either jump up and down to reduce the heat or you jump out of the heating system. So, if the heated plate is very long then you try to jump up and down and try to survive. That is how most of the electrons survive if the energy supplied to the electrode is less than its work function. So, to release the electron from a metal you have to supply energy much more than the work function. So, above the work function uh, quantity you can supply any amount of energy and then if you supply more energy more electrons will be released otherwise if you supply less energy less electrons will be released. released. So, the energy of the electromagnetic radiation required to eject the photo electron is also it is approximately equal to the work function of the irradiated surface that is the metal electrode from which they are made. Therefore, what we can conclude that no electron will be really ejected until the sum of the work function k dot into E m is realized. Okay. The as long as it does not exceed the electrons will not be released and that quantity is the multi, uh, multiplication of the electromagnetic radiation energy work function energy multiplied by the kinetic energy. So, the energy is not uniformly distributed over the beam front, but concentrated in packets or bundles of energy which is that means it is quantized that it is a thumping confirmation of the quantum mechanical theory. You keep on supplying enough energy continuously over a uh, to a metal nothing will happen. Above that above the critical k dot into E m the electrons will be released. That means, in between there are no in between states through which continuous uh, ejection of the electrons take place. So, that is a point we should remember 
because in all quantum mechanical theory we always say that the electrons behave in a quantized manner. So, if the electrons are to be absorbed still they need an energy corresponding to the difference between the energy levels only when it is supplied they get absorbed and if they have to be released they will release they will the released energy also will correspond to the quantized energy difference between the two energy states through which uh, the electrons will pass through. So, the quantum mechanical theory itself is proven by this work function concept. So, the this equation what I had shown you earlier that is k into E m is equal to h mu minus w or w e is equal to k e plus w that is equal to h c by lambda this equation permits the calculation of the energy of any electromagnetic radiation of known frequency. If, if you know the frequency or wavelength you see the, you remember this last equation uh, h is constant c is constant and lambda is the wavelength. So, either you should determine the wavelength or frequency both are connected the interrelated as I taught you in the last class and this equation permits the calculation of the energy of any electromagnetic radiation of known frequency or wavelength or and vice versa. If you know the frequency you can calculate the energy, if you know the energy you can calculate the wavelength or frequency either way. So, the concept of work function is very important in most of the detectors and where do we use a detector? We use a detector in a spectrophotometer or spectrometer or emission spectrometer, spectrographs and so many other places wherever we have to determine the energy of a an electron or a photon we need the concept of uh, work function. So, we can I am going to give you a small example here that is an x-ray photon is having 5.5 angstroms. What is 5.5 angstrom? It is the wavelength. So, I can calculate E is equal to h mu or h c by lambda. We know the value of h that is 6.63 into 10 raise to minus 34 joules per second joules second sorry and then c we know value of c. c is the velocity of light that is 3 into 10 raise to 8 meters per second or you can also write 3 into 10 raise to 10 uh, centimeters per second. Uh, this joules also you can express in ergs. Uh, so, 5.5 angstrom units we are using here uh, that is the wavelength given data and you to convert that you have to convert multiply it by 10 raise to minus 10 this table I have shown you in the earlier class. Okay. So, if I substitute all these values what I get is 2.26 into 10 raise to 3 electron volts. That means, if I have a wavelength an x-ray radiation of corresponding to 5.5 angstroms the corresponding energy of that radiation is 2.26 into 10 raise to 3 electron volts. Okay. Now, I can show you uh, uh, another example here I am showing you you have to calculate the energy of the 430 nanometer photon of visible radiation. Now, I think uh, you should uh, remember that 430 nanometer is a visible range. So, if you remember my earlier uh, slide the ultraviolet range starts from 180 to 350 and then from 350 to 800 nanometers is the visible range. So, this is around 430 that means, it is it corresponds to somewhat orangish color uh, of the uh, rainbow and if I have that kind of radiation the top portion that is numerator will remain the same because it is nothing but Planck's constant multiplied by the velocity of radiation 
and this you can con convert into 430 nanometer that is a given photon convert it into uh, meters and that works out to approximately 4.6255 into 10 raise to minus 19. So, the energy of the radiation is usually expressed in kilojoules per mole. That means, if I have what is 1 mole? A 1 mole of any substance should contain 6.23 into 10 raise to 23 or 6.02 if you want to use the uh, current uh, number correct number it is 6.02 into 10 raise to 23 is the number. So, if you take 1 mole of water it will have 6.02 into 10 raise to 23 molecules of water. If you take copper 1 mole that means, 6.02 into 10 raise to 23 atoms will be there. Like that if I take photons 1 mole of photons should be 6.02 into 10 raise to 23 photons. So, I can express this energy see 4.6255 into 10 raise to minus 19 I have to multiply it by the mole fraction. So, 6.02 into 10 raise to 23 photons per mole and this is so many joules per photon. So, how many how much photons uh, what is the total energy of 6 uh, so many photons and you can convert uh, from joules to kilojoules also that is you have to multiply by 10 raise to minus 3 or divide by 1000 and what you end up is approximately 278.4551 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So, this is how most of the energies of the uh, radiation is calculated. We will uh, continue our study discussion on the photoelectric effect after a small gap of about 5 minutes. <laughs>